Tick Thrombosis Canada's recommendations and actions we can all take in response to the PMPRB. Thank you for joining us and thank you to those who have submitted questions in advance of the webinar. I'd also like to acknowledge our donors whose contributions are enabling this important advocacy work. Uh, my name is Eric Mariglia. I'm the Associate of Government Relations and Advocacy at CF Canada and uh, the moderator for today's presentation. Before in I introduce our speakers, I have a few technical reminders. Uh, all participants are muted with the exception of myself as the moderator and our presenters. Uh, this is to avoid any background noise or distractions that often occur during uh, any type of large video call or conference. If you'd like to submit a question, please use the chat function and choose the option of all panelists. We will do our best to monitor it and address the questions. If we don't get to, your, uh, if we don't get to answer your question today, or if we don't have uh, an answer for your question, we will investigate separately and post to the PMPRB section on the CF Canada um, website. And if you wish to view the session again, it will be recorded and shared on our website. Today, uh, you'll be hearing from Dr. John Wallenberg, our Chief Scientific Officer for Cystic Fibrosis Canada, and Kim Steele, our Director of Government and Community Relations for CF Canada. Over the next hour, we'll be covering the following, a brief summary of CF Canada's recommendations to the PMPRB, actions CF Canada is taking, and opportunities for the community to get involved questions that have been submitted to us in advance, and questions that we'll be receiving uh, during this presentation. I would now like to introduce uh, Dr. John Wallenberg to provide some background on CF Canada's position on the PMPRB and our recommendations we have submitted. John, over to you. Thanks, Eric, and uh, welcome everyone. I'm glad everyone could join us. I wish I could see everyone, unfortunately, uh, not there. Uh, as background, the new, uh, since the new draft guidelines were shared on June 19th, we've taken some time to consult with our uh, advisors, with experts in the, the field and other patient groups to try and understand the guidelines, what the guidelines will have, the impact they'll have on Tricasta, but also future, uh, future medicines. There have been some excellent uh, webinars. IMC had an excellent webinar. Uh, uh, CORD had another excellent webinar. And those were also incredibly informative, and I hope uh, I hope some of you have been able to participate on on those as well. The gra that draft guidelines are complex and quite technical in nature, and we wanted to be sure that we were thoughtful and developed a re robust and and well informed response. On Tuesday, July 28th, we submitted to the PMPRB our position along with our key recommendations. Overall, our position on the guidelines is that there are some provisions that could enable access to TRICASTA, but in general, the guidelines are still troubling as they go too far. We've developed some, as I said, key recommendations that we feel are critical to ensuring access to TRICASTA as soon as possible, as well as ensuring access to future drugs for cystic fibrosis. Our first recommendation <clears throat> is as a commitment to lowering drug costs to reasonable level, we support and we urge the PMBRB to take a phased approach to the implementation of the guidelines to begin with, with the changes to the comparator countries. All other changes aimed at further reducing the pressure should be on, put on hold until the PMPRB can learn about the impact of implementing phase one and until the impact of the new economic criteria, which like I said, are quite complex, can be thoroughly eval evaluated by an independent third party. Our second recommendation uh, uh, relates to providing access to innovative medicines for Canadians who need them now, and we're calling on the PMPRB to immediately amend the Health Canada approval deadline for GAP medicines, which was described in the amended guidelines, to an application deadline. Under this amendment, manufacturers would have until January 2nd, 2021 to apply for a drug identification number rather than having to secure a DIN by that time as outlined in the current guidelines. Our third recommendation is to have an independent third party evaluate the impact of the revised pharmacoeconomic criteria on the availability of medicines in Canada specifically to inform any decision on whether, when, and how to implement the use of these new criteria, in particular for innovative precision and other high cost medicines. We'll be talking more about this later on. 
until this is completed, the value of the and the value of these measures is demonstrated. None of these measures should be adopted. And finally, we call on the federal government to require that the PM PRB, along with other appropriate agencies, immediately establish a formal mechanism for meaningful and continuously engaging patient representation representatives in its decision making processes to ensure that the patient voice choices uh, uh, and representation are heard. Patient advisory councils aimed at improving access for themselves and others are utilized in many of Canada's comparative countries. Now that the PMPRB will be weighing in on the economic value of patient lives, patients need to be at the table to weigh in on, their li on the value of their lives too. Thanks, John. Uh, Kim, could you now uh, walk us through uh, the actions we at CF Canada are taking to assure our concerns are heard and uh, the opportunities for the community to also get involved? Absolutely. Thanks, Eric. <clears throat> uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, here at CF Canada, we do have a wide range of plans to continue to keep the pressure on, and we would greatly appreciate it if the community's help uh, could, could uh, amplify our collective voices. Uh, first, we're asking for our community to join us uh, as we call on the PMPRB to implement the recommendations that, that John just discussed, and we will get further into further details about those later in the discussion. Um, we have a template letter that's being shared so that the community can echo uh, their support for our recommendations and so that we can collectively ensure that the PMPRB hears our feedback before the stakeholder consultation period ends on August 4th, 2020. So that is next week. So really we're calling on people uh, to move rather quickly um, to say we support these recommendations because we want to see those recommendations in the final set of the guidelines, which will come out in the fall. Since we launched uh, this this project yesterday, our letter has been downloaded by almost, uh, almost a thousand times and to our knowledge uh, has been uh, submitted to the PMPRB by email uh, at least 220 times. So a huge thanks to all of you who have taken action. Uh, obviously, we'd like to build that before we get to the August 4th deadline. Um, and uh, if you have any questions about that, just feel free to email us at advocacy at cysticfibrosis.ca. That's advocacy at cysticfibrosis.ca. And next, after uh, this push to August 4th, we're really planning uh, uh, to uh, do a very fulsome outreach to members of, of, of Parliament. And I will speak a little later about um, the push that we did in the spring uh, through our MP, uh, the Shia Can't Wait Member of Parliament Constituency Meeting Challenge, and how that work is going to help us amplify this, this, this next piece of work. And then thirdly, CF Canada uh, will be submitting a letter to Vertex, uh, just noting the extensive uh, work that our community has done uh, to lay a path forward for Trikafta and the urgent need for them to apply at this time. Thank you, Kim. Uh, sorry, apply for Health Canada approval at this time. Thank you, Kim. Uh, we're now going to address some of the questions that were uh, already submitted. So uh, the, the first question, uh, is uh, um, going to be over to you, Kim, and uh, that is just what is the PMPRB? Sure, the PMPRB in short is the Patented Medicines Prices Review Board. It's an independent quasi-judicial body that regulates the, maxim the, the maximum amount that uh, companies can charge for patented medicines in Canada. So when a drug's coming into Canada, it goes to Health Canada for approval, it goes to the PMPRB uh, for pricing. Um, we did receive a, a question that kind of relates to this, and that was, um, uh, how is the, who is the PMPRB? How are they formed? Um, how are they, you know, appointed? And uh, the, the, the PMPR, PMPRB is an agency of Health Canada, um, and the board is appointed actually through an order in council, uh, so through the federal government. Um, and uh, like other you know, parts of, of, of government, uh, there is a public servant structure in place that, that really drives the work. Uh, but there is a board, um, they are appointed by a governor and council, and, uh, and um, uh, for anybody who would like more information on that, that's available on the PMPRB website. Uh, thanks, Kim. 
uh, for our next question, it's uh, wh why does the PMPRB matter when it comes to access to Trikafta? Uh, uh, John, uh, perhaps you could answer this question. Yeah, sure. As Kim, Kim said, the PMPRB sets the maximum price a company can charge for a patented medicine in Canada. Uh, the, the current regulations, the changes to the current regulations will, will lead to drug prices being reduced by an estimated 45 to 70 percent, 75 percent. And it's going to make Canada a less favorable market for innovative medicines. In addition, note the gap between the 45 and the 75 percent. So this introduces a, a great measure of uncertainty. Uh, I mean, this is the difference between selling a drug for or selling something for $300 or $200. And clearly that's going to make a difference in, in where somebody chooses to go and market a, a product. So uh, when, when asked why they didn't apply for uh, Health Canada approval for TriCast, Vertex Pharmaceuticals did point directly to the changes in the unpredictable regulatory environment in Canada. Thanks, John. Uh, for our next question, why is the PMPRB doing this and why are they making these changes? Uh, Kim, uh, perhaps this one over to you. Yeah, I mean, it is a very good question and, and one I think that uh, many Canadians really aren't aware of in terms of these changes uh, happening that will impact anybody who's going to be accessing drugs now or in the future. Uh, so the PMPRB has actually been given direction to reduce drug prices by the Government of Canada as a means to fund national pharmacare and in an effort to modernize its policies, which uh, have, have not been modernized in some time. Um, John, you may have a few things to add here. Thanks, Kim. Yeah, I, I, I do, and it's a little bit of rambling, but in, in many ways, this is part of the problem with the PMPRB, our changes. The, the, the changes seem to want to make the Canadian system operate much like a national pharmacare systems that, that inspire them. But the Canadian system is a very different animal than those national pharmacare systems. In fact, as you've pointed out, Kim, in the past, the Canadian system more closely resembles the unregulated system in the U.S. with dozens of public payers and hundreds of private payers, basically insurance companies that offer drug coverage as part of their benefits programs. You cannot simply squeeze all drugs into a formulaic price control system and expect it to work equally well with all drugs. This is especially true for drugs with rare, for rare disorders, where it's already been shown that some of the pharmacoeconomic measures that the PMPRB want to apply don't work well. In my opinion, the PMPRB are conducting a massive social experiment, introducing a new system that combines a number of pharmacoeconomic factors in novel ways and applying them to a completely different system than for what they were intended, and where Canada, Canadians, are, are, are serving as the guinea pigs. And that's just too risky an approach. Thanks, John. Uh, I, I was just mentioned National Pharmacare. So this, this next question, uh, won't National Pharmacare help us get Trikafta? Uh, Kim, perhaps you can address this question. No, in fact, uh, the National Pharmacare model that is being considered by the federal government at present <clears throat> won't necessarily help and may actually hinder access to CF symptom management drugs uh, without a certainty and a, a path forward for, for modulators. So the, you know, the, the National Pharmacare plan that is being proposed is largely being financed <clears throat> through reductions uh, in prices uh, in different parts of the system, including in, in, in the area of, of, of medicines and innovative medicines in particular. And it also focuses on bulk purchasing and deep discounts that are tied to that bulk purchasing. Um, and anybody with a rare disease knows that there's nothing in bulk about having a rare disease. We have specialized drugs for, for good reason in, in cystic fibrosis. People with CF need a um, variety of antibiotics, not just the antibiotics that we're going to buy in bulk. So, you know, while the government has promised, the federal government has promised a rare disease strategy, um, that could provide a, a fair and fast process for access to drugs like Trikafta. We've seen little movement, although we do continue to push. Um, I think the other thing to, to understand here is there's still work to do at the provincial level too to protect CF drug programs. If, if the provinces are feeling like the feds are gonna pick up some of these drug costs, I, I think they're probably wrong. Um, you know, but we need to continue to put a focus on having a fast and fair process 
uh, for access to game-changing therapies like Trikafta. Um, and, and that's what we'll continue to do in our work, both with federal and, and provincial governments. If you're interested in helping us with that work, you can write to us again at advocacy at cysticfibrosis.ca. So that's advocacy at cysticfibrosis.ca. Uh, Kim, this, this next question really connects well to that, having that fast and fair process. And the question is, you know, once the medication is approved, how long before patients will be able to receive it? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, when John was alluding to the complexity of Canada's system of, of payers or insurers, <clears throat> public and private, um, it really, you know, helps to demonstrate that the, 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 the challenges that we face in Canada in getting a drug in the country and into a patient. Um, so sadly, you know, these drugs can take between two to five years and, and it, sometimes it doesn't even matter um, the efficacy or the innovative uh, value that the drug adds uh, compared to existing therapies or, or even if it's a first-in-kind therapy. Um, it can sometimes take very long because we have a system that is very uh, duplicitous and onerous and lots of checks and balances. And, you know, so our, our um, approach here in terms of looking at Trikafta and what we're calling game-changing medicines, precision medicines, medicines for rare diseases, are again that we need that fast and fair process. The US got Trikafta in, it, you know, they did the review in six months. They had not one, not two, not three, but four mechanisms through which they could fast track the drug. In Canada, we have one. It's at the Health Canada level, which is the first point of contact in the system. And it takes that review, which is really a, a review of the quality and effectiveness um, and safety of the drug it takes that review to six months, but it doesn't do anything to uh, to expedite the rest of the process. So as we continue to access uh, to work toward access to drugs, we also continue to look at system change um, and and really advocate for change uh, to get drugs to people faster. Thank you, Kim. Our, our next question, uh, John, I'm, I think I'm going to uh, pose this one to you. Uh, why is uh, this fight so uh, focused on Trikafta? What about access to the other modulators? That's a, that's a great question. Well, Trikafta is in the spotlight right now because it's one of the first highly innovative medicines in the pipeline to be directly impacted by these new regulations. So it's serving to highlight the problems and not just for Canadians with CF, but for the broader population. This might be happening to Tricasta now, but these changes will have a similar impact on all new cutting edge medicines like it in the future, and that should concern all Canadians. So it's kind of like the canary in the, in the coal mine. But CF Canada is committed to fighting for access to all CF medicines, and this includes improving access to existing modulators, which are available to all, far too few Canadians. Uh, CF patients, uh, uh, all Canadian patients, deserve a system that enables access to the best new life-changing medicines available, and not one that unfairly unnecessarily delays or denies access to, the, to these medicines. And we're fully aware that, that, that there are you know, disparities across the country. We continue to advocate for access to existing modulators in all provinces and, and equitable uh, availability for all drugs in all provinces. Thanks to our community's advocacy efforts in June, we became one. We, we got one step closer to gaining access to the to the mod, modulators when uh, the PCPA and uh, the drugs manufacturer Vertex agreed to begin negotiations for Kalydeco and Arcami, which have already been approved uh, by Health Canada. There are no timelines associated with this types of negotiations, so we're applying pressure on the provincial governments to expedite the negotiations. Again, if you'd like to know more, or if you want to know how you can help email us at advocacy at cysticfibrosis.ca. Tricast is not presently included in the PCPA negotiations in part below, largely because it hasn't been submitted to Health Canada for approval. But we hope that the negotiations with Colidico and, and or Canby will encourage the submission of Tricast by the manufacturer to, uh, to Health Canada. Thanks, John. Uh, uh, John, uh, the next question is, are there any further patented uh, medications for approval? Um, right. Health Canada reviews and approves a number of different drugs for different diseases throughout the year. 
um, you can actually go on, onto their website and you can look at a list of, of things that are under, you know, have been submitted for approval and that have been approved. To our knowledge, Health Canada is not currently reviewing any new patented medicines for cystic fibrosis. Another way to get a sense of what is coming in the pipeline is you can go to our clinical trial finder, for example, on our website. There you can find a list of drugs that are currently in clinical trials. The later the phase, IG for, for example, phase one, two, or three, the closer that drug is to submission for approval. Drugs in phase four studies, if you see any of those, those are already on the market. Thanks, John. Uh, this uh, next question is for you as well. Uh, it's in regards to gene testing. With gene testing, uh, uh, will there be an opportunity for CF patients to try new drugs and their effects? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we've uh, we've partnered with uh, Hospital for Sick Kids here for the, uh, the the program for individualized therapy known as CFIT. And they're developing a platform that will allow an individual's response to a given drug to be predicted in the laboratory before ever exposing the patient to the drug. So this will help industry choose which drugs to pri prioritize for development for which mutations, as well as helping physicians choose the best drugs for their patients, especially for those with the most rare mutations. But that platform still weighs off from clinical use, but there are other tools also under development in Europe, for example, that will do something similar. Clinical trials are another great way for patients to help in the development of new drugs. And while it's not the primary objective of trials, which is to demonstrate safety and efficacy, they do provide a means for Canadians to gain early access to some of the most innovative and cutting edge therapies under development. The Cystic Fibrosis Canada Accelerating Clinical Trials Network, or CF CanAct, provides Canadians with CF an opportunity to enroll in trials. We recently expanded it to include even more sites with greater geographic coverage, meaning that over 60% of our CF population now have access to clinical trials through their clinics. For more information, you can speak with your physician or consult our website. Finally, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation in the United States also has a trial finder on their website that provides information on trials as does Health Canada's clinical trials database or the website clinicaltrials.gov. Thank you, John. Uh, Kim, uh, this next question I'm going to pass over to you, and it's uh, the the guidelines. Uh, the question is: the guidelines do not appear to accommodate the uh, strategy for rare diseases set out in the Hoskins report on pharmacare. Would it be possible for the Drug Pricing Review Board to head in that direction? Thanks, Eric. And this this is a very interesting uh, question. As I as I said um, earlier. Uh, you know, the pharmacare model that, that is being proposed uh, is not necessarily the pharmacare model that I think we would build at Cystic Fibrosis Canada. Um, it, it probably won't uh, really improve access to many cystic fibrosis medicines. Um, but, you know, pharmacare is, is, is bigger than this and, and, and the vision is, is, is bigger than that. And part of that vision is a process, uh, a rare disease uh, or a strategy, I think is what they say, to address access to, to rare diseases. So that commitment was made in the federal 2019 budget. Um, you know, and we do, Cystic Fibrosis Canada, we advocate for a fast and fair process. Uh, approval and access process for precision medicines like Trikafta and, and for drugs for rare diseases in general. So, you know, I think with the PMPRB um, looking at those cost savings, as they call them, uh, by re reducing the, 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 the drug prices, that is the, the intention is to help uh, use those funds to build that national pharmacare model. Now that model uh, was re re reinforced um, in the ministerial mandate letters that the prime minister uh, gives to the ministers post-election. So, you know, we have a commitment and a budget for, for a strategy uh, to be implemented in 2023. Uh, both the, the Minister of Health, the Finance Minister and other key ministers and junior ministers, junior ministers have um, a stated expectation to deliver that program in their mandate letters from the fall of 2019. Um, but we've seen very little action. And, you know, in fact, I, you know, one of our concerns is if we're taking too much money under the, the, the PMPRB uh, pricing, um, 
um, uh, bucket, if we're if we're driving pharmaceutical prices down too far, um, how are we going to fund this model? Um, you know, uh, there will be funding, but we won't be able to pay for the expensive drugs. Um, and 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 so, you know, I think this is a piece uh, creating that fast and fair process uh, for drugs for rare disease for precision medicines. This is a piece that we continue and and need to continue to hammer the federal government on. Um, to get done. It's, it's actually a piece that could probably be done much more simply than an active, uh, than a complete entire national pharmacare program. It could be a stepping stone uh, for, the, for the government to get it right. Uh, we just need to keep raising our voices and this will certainly be and continue to be a, a pressure point that we put on the federal government. I think one more other thing just in terms of this is I would say that most provincial governments are interested in participating in some type of program um, uh, that would uh, uh, collectively improve access to drugs for diseases and, and precision medicines. Um, I would say that probably most provinces are not really in a position right now uh, in which they're favorable to a national pharma care program. So I think we have a political opportunity here to really um, tell the feds, let's start with the rare disease strategy. You've made the commitment, now's the time. Thanks, Kim. Uh, I'm going to move along to the next question. And uh, John, I'm going to give this one to you. And is where is Vertex in all of this? Why haven't they applied yet? That's an excellent question to ask Vertex. Um, <laughs> the, uh, based on our conversations with them, we know that, that the uncertainty around the PMPRB or changes is, was the primary barrier to them applying. That's, that's what they've told us. But you know, we've worked with governments across Canada and the PMPRB to let them know of, the, uh, of our opinion of the changes and, and to really get their support in fast tracking TriCAFTA through the system once uh, Vertex does apply. You know, Canadians have advocated long and hard for access to Vertex as CFTR modulators. Kaleidico and Hard One fought in, uh, fight in, in, in Ontario led by a CF family. Uh, or Canby has been supported by multiple players over the years and now there's been a fight for TriCAFTA. You know, our network of advocates and volunteers through our constituency challenge met with 40% of members of parliament. And that kind of ensured that, you know, our call for access to scrap was heard at every level and in every party caucus on Parliament Hill. Our community sent over 700 letters to the PMPRB to let them know that we wouldn't sit idly by while barriers were raised. And remarkably, the PMPRB spent an entire section addressing the issues specifically of vertex of drugs during their public webinar on July 8th. It's a direct result of those letters. Mm -hmm. um, I'm currently, in addition, there's a, currently there's a community-based letter writing campaign that sent over 8,000 letters to PMPRB. CF might be a rare disease, but no other conditions gotten, garnered that kind of attention. So Canadians have done their part. It's, it's time for Vertex to step in, up and do its part. And, and we're calling on the company to immediately submit TriCAFTA to Health Canada for regulatory approval. Thanks, John. So I know we, we mentioned a lot of bodies, sometimes PMPRB, sometimes uh, we've had announcements obviously about PCPA. So this next question, Kim, I'm gonna give to you and it's how does Orcambi and the Kaleidico negotiations relate to this? Sure, uh, also an excellent question and one, uh, uh, one that uh, takes a little bit of explaining of how the system works. So I'll, I'll spend a bit of time doing that. So if we think about our healthcare system, when a drug comes to Canada, it goes to Health Canada, and as I mentioned earlier, it gets assessed there for safety, quality, and efficacy. If it gets a, a, an approval or a partial approval, it will then go uh, to the PMPRB, the Patented Medicines Prices Review Board, uh, which uh, sets the maximum uh, price that can be charged for the drug. And uh, that's some of the challenges that we're having with them right now is that they wanna significantly reduce that. So the PMPRB is the first pricing body in, in the country when a drug comes in. It will drive that price down um, to the level uh, to which it, it, it will, um, you know, according to the regulations and, and the guidelines. Once that drug goes through the PMPRB, goes through the rest of the system, it gets looked at by a number of other bodies, and if it reaches what is called the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance, which is at the back end of the system, or the PCPA, 
um, that's the second pricing body. Uh, so, so this body would look at that maximum price that the PMPRB set and say to the manufacturer, can we negotiate down you down some more if provinces A, B, and C, um, you know, buy this drug? Um, and 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 the provinces can um, they can negotiate collectively or partially, like as a whole, or just three provinces through this body. So so when we think about Orkambi and Kaleidico being in the PCPA negotiations. We can think about it in the in the as I say, made their way through the rest of the system. Um, they're now sitting and literally sitting and waiting to be negotiated, and there are no timelines on these negotiations, as 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 mentioned earlier. So this is one of the reasons why we're working with our national advocacy network and the broader community to to to, to tell the provinces to get going on 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 negotiating a price for these drugs. Um, because uh, let's face it, they've been approved by Health Canada for some time and um, access has been extremely limited. Um, you know, at the same time, we do see an opportunity here, uh, as we said, that if we can get, if we can line up certain review bodies in the system to, so that they're doing either uh, what I would say is uh, um, um, they'd be, be reviewing things at the same time or in rapid succession. If we can get that done for Trikafta, uh, we might be able to get that into these negotiations as well, which I think is, you know, more attractive for, for governments and, and the manufacturer and certainly in the best interest of people with CF. Perfect. Thank you, Kim. Uh, for this next question, I'll, it's really for the both of you, and uh, it's what is next for CF Canada? Sure. So as mentioned uh, earlier, in the spring, we rolled out our CF Can't Wait constituency challenge, uh, through which national, our national advocacy, net, advocacy network and the broader community met with those 40% of members of parliament. That was right across the country, and we talked to those members of parliament about two things. One is we need to stop these guidelines, the former set of guidelines that were coming through, and uh, and we need to uh, we need to uh, get Trikafta into the country. So we were successful in in getting um, the guidelines stopped, but tri Trikafta is still not in the country. Uh, so now we will be going back to those members of Parliament, talking about the recommendations we have for the new guidelines. Uh, one of which really appeals uh, to uh, getting Trikafta into the country. Um, so, so we will continue to push through uh, the fall uh, in meeting with our members of parliament, but we're also, as I mentioned earlier, meeting at the provincial level to make sure those negotiations are moving and also that we're uh, filling in gaps where there are, uh, where, where, where there isn't coverage for certain essential CF medicines. So. Uh, on the federal front with the PMPRB, we are asking people to send letters of support. When we launch the MP strategy uh, in the coming weeks, uh, we will have a number of tools and resources that you can use. And, um, and, uh, and, you know, and what we need to keep in mind is at this time, it's really crucial that we keep the heat on both levels of government, um, the front end and the back end, as I said. Uh, because it's somewhere in the middle that uh, that access is going to happen. We need to keep the pressure on the company as well. Mm -hmm. uh, as mentioned earlier, I mean Canadians have done advocated long and hard for access to Vertex's drugs. They've just done a, we've, the community's just done a phenomenal job of of bringing this up into the attention of of of, of government. We've had tremendous media coverage as well. So you know it's, we're, we are calling on the on the company to uh, uh, to submit Trigaf to, to 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 regulatory approval as, as soon as possible, and and that will be uh, will be sending a letter to the company briefly shortly. Thank you both. Uh, uh, last question before we move into the submitted questions uh, during the, um, this presentation uh, is uh, how will the recent um, how will the recent court ruling impact the guidelines? Uh, Kim, sure. perhaps you can answer this. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Eric. Um, I'm obviously very excited about this question, but uh, um, <laughs> but I, um, 
this is it is it's a very good question because it is uh, like the question everybody is thinking right now is is what impact will that have for those who don't know uh, th there were a number of pharmaceutical companies that banded together through the national association uh, for Canada's uh, patented medicines uh, companies and um, they they raised some points of law with uh, with uh, the federal court and very recent about the the, the scope and the um, application of, of the, the proposed PMPRV guidelines. And the ruling came in at the end of June. And what that ruling essentially said is that the calculation of net prices, which is part of the technical calculations that they have to do to get to that final price, that maximum price, uh, that, 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 that that, uh, that process as proposed by the PMPRB is outside of the scope of the Compatent Act. So what that really focuses on is there was a requirement to have uh, companies release confidential um, discounts. And, uh, and what that would do is, is make more transparency in how drugs are priced. What it also does is it opens up um, you know, uh, the company's uh, information for other countries to see so that they can use that information to drive down price as well. So there's some concerns, obviously, there by industry. With respect to, you know, how this ruling is, is going to impact the changes, right now the PMPRB is, is reviewing uh, the decision to, to, to evaluate its impact, but it said, uh, you know, on, on the consultation page that it doesn't actually anticipate any substantive changes as a, as a result. Um, however, they are interested in hearing from people. So if you have some thoughts around, uh, you know, um, uh, this court challenge, uh, you can contact them through their consultation uh, page until August 4th. And I, I will just add that in our response uh, to the, the proposed guidelines, uh, we did request that the application of economic factors, so those, those, all of those other things that we wanted the third body or the, um, um, uh, the, 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 the third party uh, to, to look at, this, uh, this net pricing is part of those economic factors that we've said we've got to put on th this on hold until it can really be assessed in, in terms of impact. Well, thank you both uh, for that. And uh, we're gonna move now into the questions that have been submitted through the chat. And uh, um, I'll, I'll start with uh, this question uh, over to you, Kim. And I, um, I know you just uh, touched upon the system briefly, but it's, can you explain the connection between uh, the PCPA, uh, um, the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance, the PMPRB and Health Canada? Sure. Um, Health Canada is the primary regulator for drugs in Canada. As I mentioned, if a drug needs to get through Health Canada approval to be sold or marketed in Canada. Um, so that is the first point of, of, of uh, review that happens. The second point then is, is the patented medicines price review where they set the, the maximum uh, amount that uh, a drug can be uh, charged for in Canada. So they're setting a maximum price, a ceiling price that pharmaceutical companies um, can can sell their drug for. Um, when that, 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 that ceiling price is established, private payers, so private insurers and public payers, public insurers, governments, um, negotiate or they try to negotiate them down um, from that maximum price. So if I set a maximum price at $100, and uh, I, uh, that's at the PMPRB, and then when it gets to the PCPA, uh, which is comprised of all of Canada's public drug programs, um, the PCPA will say, okay, I know that you can charge $100, but we want to pay 60 because we have access to the market. Essentially, the provinces and the, you know and and the private payers control that market. Um, so so the PCPA you know is 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 really about negotiating down a, what is already a price that has been established in Canada um, that that is the maximum that can be charged, um, and they can negotiate that price down based on all kinds of factors. Um, um, and, and a lot like that, that, those negotiations 
um, are not really transparent. We don't get to see what happens in those negotiations. Uh, but what we do know is some drugs get listed, some drugs don't. And, uh, and some of that has to do with the fact that um, uh, these negotiations aren't working. Um, Colatico is, is a great example. They've been to the negotiating table three times with different mutations. Um, you know, when a Health ind Canada indication was given in 2014 and in 2020, um, some people with certain mutations are only maybe getting access now. That's a problem and negotiation should not take that long. Um, um, so, you know, again, as we think about the process, PMPRB at the front, setting the maximum price, PCPA at the end, negotiating down from that net maximum price, um, uh, there's going to be some, um, we're, we're concerned that there's going to be, uh, that, that, these uh, now that the PMPRB will be doing more pricing, uh, aggressive pricing reductions, that it's going to even slow down the process even more. You're on mute. Oh, there we go. Thanks. Uh, I'll move to the next question. Um, do you have? Do we have a draft letter of support that we could use uh, and be assured that the important issues are covered? Uh, so, Kim, perhaps you can. Uh, address that question about a draft letter of support. Sure, yeah, if you go on to our um, website and under the advocacy section, there is a, a TriCaptor Can't Wait, and there are some resources there. You can see our, our submission, as well as the letter of support. And Kim, that's what you said had already been downloaded like a thousand times in the last 24 hours or something, right? Yeah, and let me just be clear. So that is a letter of support to the Patented Medicines Price Review Board to say we endorse Cystic Fibrosis Canada's recommendations. You should implement them. We, uh, we will also have some letters in the coming weeks that will be addressed at members of parliament. So one, uh, if you just want to send a letter to ask your member of parliament to support uh, our recommendations, and to uh, take actions to uh, show that support. Uh, there will be one letter for those who just want to send a letter asking uh, for their MPs to support. There will be a second letter uh, for those who want to meet with their members of parliament. Uh, and and uh, you know, we, Eric and I, we can help you with those, uh, those meetings. We will also provide uh, a briefing package that you can take into any meetings with members of parliament. So that will have a, uh, you know, uh, um, a briefing note that details uh, our, our position, um, things uh, things that you can do to get commitments uh, out of out of your elected official, uh, do's and don'ts uh, in terms of planning a meeting, and uh, as well as some important background information on cystic fibrosis, some stats and facts. Uh, so so stay tuned for that in the coming weeks. We will provide updates as as we move along um, on our social media and on our website and through our various channels. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, ideally, we would love it if everybody could send that letter to the PMPRB before August 4th under our uh, 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 Tricafta Can't Wait uh, campaign, and then uh, come back in a few weeks and either meet with your member of parliament or, um, or send them a letter asking for support. Thanks, Kim. Uh, for our next question, and I'll just um, uh, state that uh, we're going to do our best to get through um, all the questions that have been submitted. There is uh, quite a large number of them, which is great to see, uh, but if we're not able to uh, get to your question um, as stated before, we will uh, um, answer it and ensure that's posted on our website. So for our next question, uh, um, Kim, I'll, I'll give this one to you as well. Um, how can these PMPRB regulations be implemented when there isn't a policy in place for rare diseases yet, AKA a pan-Canadian rare disease strategy? Um, um, yeah, I mean, I, the two are, are definitely connected, but uh, as mentioned previously, this, this federal government uh, is actually utilizing the cost savings uh, made through drug pricing reductions at the PMPR level to fund National Pharmacare and uh, what would be uh, as part of that a rare disease strategy. So, you know, we continue to work with the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders 
uh, we, we continue to work with our community on the need for that fast and fair process for these drugs for rare disease strategy. As I mentioned earlier, it's been committed to uh, in, in the budget and in mandate letters to ministers. I think it's time that we just need to keep hammering uh, the importance of getting this in place. Uh, think about it as a step toward national pharmacare and, and uh, something that is urgently and desperately needed now. But the, the, the PMPRB, there's nothing within, to my knowledge, their regulatory framework or um, their policy framework uh, that, uh, that requires them to uh, look at these drugs as uh, in a different way. Um, and, and we keep telling them that they need to look at these drugs in a different way. We did see some nuances in the new set of guidelines, um, but again, we don't think they go far enough in terms of uh, getting access to future therapies. And, and it's important to, to be clear here that, you know, the new PMPRB changes, they apply to all drugs. So drugs for rare diseases are still a small subset of the total drugs available in Canada. So these PMPRB regulations, it, 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 you know, yes, the rare dr strategy for rare drugs is important for it, but, but these apply to everything. So they're not, there's not a direct condition on one on the other one. Mm -hmm. It would make it a lot easier if we had a process um, because, you know, if we could line up from the PMPRB with a process all the way through uh, to the end of the system, that's the ideal. And, um, you know, we have to keep fighting for that. Great. Thank you both. Uh, John, I'm going to give you this question is, has anyone reached out to Vertex for a comment on the PMPRB revisions? and how this relates to some, uh, submission for Trikafta. Also, if applied before January, is there not a grandfathering clause that would apply before 20, uh, 2021? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I have had conversations with Vertex about the, the barriers. Uh, their concerns remain about the uncertainty around the pricing, but there still remains uncertainty about the confidentiality of, of the final prices in Canada. And you can understand that, that that's important for a company that, has, that works on a global market because other countries, in the same way that we look at comparator countries, there are other customers, other country customers in the world that look at Canada as a comparator. And so, you know, if, if, if it becomes disclosed that Canada is selling uh, the drug at a significantly lower price than other countries, that's clearly going to be a concern for Vertex Pharmaceuticals. I mean, one of our contentions, though, is, is honestly, you know, life is full of uncertainty. People with cystic fibrosis know this. Um, and, and, you know, frankly, with all of the efforts that the Canadian community have done, we, we just don't think it, it, it's, it's credible any longer for, for a pharmaceutical company, you know, with a $70 billion market cap to, to be intimidated by the uncertainty of the PMPRB and regulations to the point of saying, oh no, we can't file in Canada. So we, we need to go out and we need to, to put that pressure on the company. Canadians need these drugs. As, and, and I wanna to touch on the grandfathering point. So there was a definition of gap medicines and that really was for drugs that were going to get a drug identification number. So Health Canada approval before January 2nd, 2021. But it's a six month process. And so when that came out, there, were like, there was like a two-week period for a company to be able to apply, and it just wasn't realistic. What we've called for in our recommendations is that it's not that they have received that drug identification number, but that they've submitted to Health Canada before January 2nd. And then that drug would be, uh, would be grandfathered as a, as a gap medicine. Perfect. Thanks, John. So for our next question, um, when can we expect to know which way things are, are going to go? It's been a long, a long wait to find out if Vertex um, is even going to submit Trikafta to Health Canada. Will we have to wait to find out until January 2021 when the guidelines take effect? Uh, John, perhaps you could answer this question. Uh, I think it's a, that's a great question, but you know, like all questions where you're trying to predict the future, boy, it's tough to answer. Um, we, we've already seen some indication. Um, after all of the pressure that was put on the PMPRB in the spring, they did make amendments. There, we saw movement. Um, we've also seen 
uh, or at least heard some, some movement uh, elsewhere in the system, for example, PCPA uh, uh, and, and Vertex sitting down to negotiate for Kaleidico and or Candy. So we've seen movement and, and certainly I find those promising. Where we're gonna end up, uh, um, it, it's unclear to me. Kim, I don't know if you have any information about like when the dates are. I mean, the, the consultation period ends on August 4th. Do we have a date when they're actually going to come out with the final recommendations after that consultation period? Is that known yet? You're on mute, by the way. It will be it will be sometime in the fall, uh, September, October, which is why we're really ramping up our MP off um, our our MP activity. Uh, we want to make sure that we are talking to them as uh, the the federal government is talking about these changes. But I don't, we don't, part of the, this is part of the uncertainty, certainty is I don't believe we have a specific date yet, but um, let me look into that further because uh, new information is, is coming out all the time. And uh, if we do, if we, if we are able to lock down a, a date uh, regarding um, uh, the publishing of what would be the final guidelines, um, uh, then we, we will share it uh, through our various channels. Perfect. Thank you both. Uh, next question is, have CF clinics across the country rallied together and shown their support in the fight for access? Why don't we hear about this from our clinics and care teams? Uh, Kim, perhaps you can address this question. Well, I'll talk a little bit and maybe John might have uh, something to say too. Um, it's, you know, our, our care teams um, do a lot behind the scenes that I think we, uh, many of us don't see. Um, when we were dealing with the uh, Trikafta backup uh, for the special access program before Christmas, clinicians were right there to, to, to kind of speak with Health Canada and the company and say, we need to sort this out so that people can get this medicine quickly. Um, we do have clinicians who are, are part of our national advocacy program and they're going to meetings and they're, they're um, you know, helping us uh, build that evidence base that we need to, to, to have a compelling business case for government for these drugs. Um, and I think going forward, uh, we, you know, we've, we've done some uh, education initiatives with clinicians around the patented medicines crisis review board, the impact that that's going to have on, on access. Um, so I think they're, uh, they're more in tune uh, with what the policy environment is looking like on the access front. And uh, I think you'll see uh, some more activity as we move forward uh, with Trikafta and, and in closing those gaps in symptom management drugs and just coverage to existing modulators across the country. Uh, John, anything to add? Yeah. To Absolutely. I mean, Kim, I'm going to, you know, further, I mean, when we had the press conferences in the spring, we had clinicians uh, participate in those, those press conferences. Like you said, they're doing a lot of work of, often in the background that we don't necessarily see. Uh, I know there's a group of clinicians that are, are advocating in Alberta who, who are, are asking the Alberta government to, to, um, uh, to, to support uh, uh, modulators in that province. And it, it, you know, the, the, the situation with Trikafta has actually helped us understand something. It's highlighted an issue that there actually isn't a, a sort of cystic fibrosis medical association in Canada. And so um, this is something that we're going to be doing with our clinicians is to create a body where we can work with them and to help them have that kind of unified voice. Because right now there just isn't a body that allows them to do that. So uh, we're, we're going to be working with them to try and help them come together with a unified voice and to, to lever their expertise in, 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 in the, uh, the advocacy efforts that we're doing. Perfect, thanks. Our uh, next question, and I think it'll have to be our last question for, for this webinar, as I said, uh, for the remaining questions, we will um, do our best to answer them and be posting that on our website. A final question I'll give is, are there any assurances of, tra uh, of transparency for the decisions of the PMPRB, i.e., will there be records showing information gathered and used to make decisions uh, of this board? Where is the patient engagement for these choices? John, perhaps you could uh, go first on this one. 
uh, you know what? I actually don't, I have no clue. I'm going to throw it back to Kim because honestly, <laughs> I, I, I don't, uh, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. Yeah, uh, I will say this. Uh, the PMPRB is not necessarily known for transparency, but they're not alone uh, throughout the drug uh, regulatory uh, review and reimbursement system. There are all kinds of pockets of places where uh, we, you know, information goes in and it doesn't come out or it doesn't come out in a way that we can understand. Um, I think anybody who attended the PMPRB um, patient public consultation uh, on July 8th uh, just saw that, you know, even information, even when they're trying to be transparent and sharing information, they do so in a way that is, is very technical, it's very complex, you have to be a health economist to be able to understand it. And, and we continue to provide this feedback. But in, in with respect to, you know, um, will we see what happens? The, the you know, one of the uh, objectives of the new guidelines is to create more transparency, uh, but where they perhaps wanted to put transparency was not necessarily where the pharmaceutical companies wanted the transparency, <laughs> i.e. what they charge in other countries, what they charge to other um, um, other provinces, right? So, so uh, I, you know, the, they do have a board, they do have to report up to Health Canada, um, they, you know, they do have a job to do uh, in terms of, of getting information out. They, they must produce an annual report, for instance, but when it comes to individual drug decision making, there's not a lot of transparency there. And I think that's one of the reasons, one of our recommendations is that they have to, you know, really commit to meaningful patient engagement and continuous engagement, uh, especially now that they're working with CADF to do the health technology assessment, you know, they're going to be putting the prices and the value on people's lives. And we need people who, who live with these diseases at that table um, so that, you know, you can talk about the value of your life too. And, you know, it's, it was important. I mean, Kelly raised this point that the PMPRB haven't been habituated to, to de dealing with the public. I mean, in the past, they were always in the background as it fixing the maximum price. And, and like Kim was saying, you know, they weren't doing these sorts of uh, um, health technology assessments. So they're, they're in a new area and, and there's probably going to be some learnings there while they learn to deal with, uh, with being transparent with the public. And it's going to be a part of our job to let them know where they're succeeding and where they're falling short. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, uh, I think we have time just to squeeze in one more question, uh, and in, it's what impact might Wayne Critchley, uh, former director of the PMPRB for 15 years, who's also former chair of the board, uh, board of the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders, uh, recent opinion have on uh, the PMPRB guidelines? I prefer sure. the most recent webinar, yeah. Yeah, sure, I can take that. I've, I've seen Wayne's um, presentation a few times. Uh, you know, Wayne is um, a consummate academic. I, I saw the, his preliminary work at the C.D. Howe Institute earlier this summer, and he's built on it since then. But even at that time, he said, I don't think these are, you know, this is the... Uh, I don't think this is the way to go. This is gonna impact access. Um, do I think that his opinion uh, is gonna sway anything? I will say that there are many people, uh, perhaps who haven't had um, the career uh, trajectory that Wayne had, but there are many academics out there, uh, people who are well-respected like Wayne, who have weighed in on these issues. Uh, we use a lot of their research uh, in trying to um, uh, you know, uh, strengthen our arguments. And and uh, the PMP is not the PMPRB is not listening to them either. So you know I think there's a lot of really well informed opinions that aren't being taken seriously. So we have to keep driving people back to the fact, uh, and by people I mean people at the PMPRB, uh, you know, and our members of parliament, elected officials. We have to keep bringing them back to the fact that there is evidence uh, that shows that this approach is risky in terms of patient access. It's just that, uh, that we haven't seriously considered that evidence. And that's really disturbing when you are an organization that is built on evidence-based decision-making. So people like Wayne, uh, people like uh, Nigel Rawson, uh, they, they need to keep raising their voices 
um, and, and I think it's up to groups like us and, and individual patients um, to carry those voices uh, to, to poke holes where we need to poke holes. And, and I, I thought Wayne's comments were, were particularly in fact impactful because Wayne's pretty balanced, to be honest with you, in, 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 in his vision. I mean, he recognized the good that PNPRB had done in its history. So, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that, that those voices aren't being taken uh, uh, more seriously. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both uh, very much. I'm afraid we're at the end of our session now. It's two o'clock. Thank you uh, again for taking the time to join us. I hope you, we have covered off at least majority of the questions. Uh, a reminder again to please submit a letter to the PMPRB. Uh, uh, the more letters sent, the stronger our voice will be. Uh, you can find a template letter on the website by searching Trikafta Can't Wait. If you'd like more information about the PMPRB and our submission, please visit the PMPRB page found on the advocacy section of our website. We'll be in touch very soon with uh, next uh, steps or, uh, in the next few weeks and uh, next steps including an MP outreach campaign. Thank you everyone. Take care. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Bye. Bye.